My goal has been from the beginning is to just try to share knowledge that people have with the public so that we can all kind of get a little more resilient to uh, the changes that are happening around us. Well, thank you, Cindy, and I want to thank the library for hosting my series. Um, and I also want to thank GNA TV here tonight uh, recording this so people can refer to it again in the future or those of who can't make it here tonight because of the six feet of snow outside um, can watch it on their local access TV. So that's great to have them here recording that. Um, anybody, is this the first time you've been to one of my presentations? Wow, excellent. Um, there is a sign-in sheet if you want to give me your email address if I didn't email you about tonight's presentation and you want to give me your name and email address, um, you can put it on the sign-in sheet and I will notify you for all future presentations. Let's see, also in the back, um, Cindy's pulled out some books um, from the library that you might want to refer to after tonight's presentation. I have a few books of my own. So a year and a half ago, my wife and Kathy Stewart, who's back there, um, went through this keeping track course with Sue Morse. Unbelievable woman. She's been tracking animals for like 40 years. Um, and one of Nancy's Christmas presents last winter was Scat and Tracks. Um, so that's a great book too, uh, to help you identify different footprints in the snow and scat, of course. Um, but great uh, resources, and there's a nice stack in the back. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or haven't met me, my name's Alan Benoit. I'm a local architect. Um, I've been doing this series about six years now. I try to never repeat a topic, which gets very challenging when you're doing 60 different presentations. Um, so if you have suggestions for topics that I may have never done before or one that you enjoyed and want to see again, just shoot me an email and I'll certainly be glad to try to schedule it in. Um, you may wonder why an architect is talking about animals surviving winter. Um, I guess the, the best way to describe it is that I'm um, a very observant. I spend a lot of time in our yard just staring at plants and watching insects and animals and their interactions. When we hike and bike in the woods, I'm constantly looking for signs and footprints and things. And fortunately, every once in a while, I have a camera so I can take some photographs. Um, so at our property, we um, do what's called permaculture. So it's permanent agriculture. So we do a lot of organic and permaculture type uh, practices as well at our homestead. So um, I feel that architecture and landscape, permaculture, all those things are really tied together. You know, one of the first things I do when I'm designing a house is, you know, where does the sun come up? Which way is south? You know, what are the views you want to see? So I think a house should be connected to the landscape and that all ties in together for me. And that's why I'm giving this presentation tonight. We forgot the book. So um, for the last 25 years, speaking of gardening, uh, I've been keeping a garden journal. And I keep track of everything that's happening in the yard when the plants are blooming for the first time, what we harvested, whether it's a cucumber the size of a watermelon, um, what kind of insects I see in the yard, how much snowfall we get, um, the weather, the temperature. I try to keep track of that every single day. I've been doing it for over 25 years now. So I have a really good reference. I know what to expect if the weather is normal. Um, and even when the weather is crazy like it has been this winter, things still happen at the same time every year. Um, so that's, uh, that's 10 years. So that's November 12th and 13th, just to give you an idea of the things that I write down. Um, to, to refer to. So looking back this week, um, 
We usually see crows starting to build nests. So you will see crows um, either breaking off twigs in trees or picking up loose twigs off the ground. Um, so that's our, that's our pair of crows in our bird bath in our backyard. Um, but they've started to pair up. And I did witness some two days ago, I think, uh, picking up twigs um, to start building their nest. So that's something to expect. The turkey vultures have already returned. They were a week and a half, two weeks early this year, but we have, we're up to about a dozen turkey vultures. We get up to about 23 um, that roost right up here on Highland Avenue, and then they'll pair off, and then they'll start heading up the valley, and you'll see a pair every 10 or 20 miles right up to Burlington um, later in the summertime. Anybody else have first signs of spring that they want to report? Yes. Robins. Flowers? Robins. Robins, yes. Anybody else? Okay, we have crocus blooming. Anybody have crocus blooming? All right. Uh, garlic. Violets? Garlic. Garlic. You have garlic blooming or growing? Growing. Growing, okay. Cold foot. Yeah, cold foot's up. Yes, I've already had a few ticks. <laughs> Excellent. So. I try to start the presentation with a little detour, but it's always related. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we were fortunate enough to travel to the Azores. Um, this is one of the islands, Tierra that we were staying on. And um, you know, everything's brown and gray here, so it's great to see green grass. And it's, um, to me, it was kind of a combination, even though I've never been to Ireland, uh, of Ireland and Hawaii. Um, but a lot of volcanic activity, uh, volcanic rock everywhere, very steep mountains, um, surrounded by water, um, but all these green, green pastures. And I was really surprised that they have Holstein cows. I don't know why, but it just reminded me of Vermont. And I was like, wow, they have Holsteins. So the whole island is pretty much dairy farming, which was surprising. And there's two out of, I think, seven islands that that's pretty much what they focus on is the dairy. And I mean, what a great life these cows have. This is the middle of winter to them. You know, it's sunny and 55, and um, they just kind of free range gra uh, graze there. Um, every single street is considered a cow path. And the cows, you know, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the farmer will move them from one pasture to the next and stops traffic on the highway or, well, the highway, the road. <laughs> and you just kind of wait for the cows to get to the next pasture. Um, sometimes they lead themselves through the woods to their own, wherever they want to go. So we were hiking through the woods up one mountain and, you know, we came across cows crossing. It was kind of interesting. But these cows have it really easy. I mean, that's the ocean. So this is their, you know, grazing field at the top of this ridge overlooking the ocean. You know, a pretty sweet life. I, I think any Vermont cow that saw this picture would be pretty jealous. And. You know, I can almost picture this cow. You know, he doesn't have a view of the ocean, but he's got that view. You know, I can picture her um, probably doing yoga at that spot. You know, it's, it's just such a tranquil, peaceful spot, really connected to nature. Um, so I will have to say that, you know, any Holstein from Vermont would love to move there. And um, they certainly don't have it as easy. So. Tonight, we're not talking about how easy the animals have it. We're talking, on the contrary, about how challenging they, they, the plants, the animals, and everything have trying to survive our winters. And there's my little disclaimer. That's me looking at little tiny things on the side of the trail, um, mosses mostly. Um, I am a licensed and registered architect. I am not a biologist, I'm not a botanist, I'm not an entomologist. Um, I'm giving this presentation, you know, kind of as entertainment, a little bit of educational experience. I'm not going to know all the answers to the really hard questions of, you know, what temperature is a bear when it hibernates or things like that. But I have some general knowledge. The big thing I do is I observe. I really spend a lot of time looking at things and trying to understand why this thing is there and what's going on. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, so Bernd Heinrich 
um, amazing writer. He used to be a professor at UVM. There's probably, what, five or six of his books back there. Oh, that, even Winter World's back there. Um, but that book is what inspired this presentation. Um, I was listening to that book, actually, um, in our travels. And it's just amazing, some of the stories, some of the things that he's discovered. And it's amazing to me how little we know about all these things. Um, you know, until he goes out and hunts down the food source of a ruby-crowned kinglet, nobody knew what they ate. You know, so he's on the cutting edge of trying to understand something that you would think everybody already know. But, um, so just amazing book, highly recommend it. And again, there's uh, Keeping Track, Sue Morse, um, great reference material. So actually, Last night, I don't know if anybody else was there, but I was there. Sue Morse gave a presentation on uh, catamounts coming back to Vermont and the potential of that happening. And um, she has some amazing photos. She's been doing it for 40 years. She's been you know, all over the country, living in the woods. She knows the calls of the animals, the habits, the habitats. Um, so if you ever get a chance to see one of her presentations, I highly recommend it. I, could, I was blown away by the photographs. You know, this doesn't do it justice, but that's one of her photographs. Um, and she had so many of kitten cubs and different uh, rituals that the animals do. So just amazing. All right, so who remembers a normal winter? <laughs> right? Certainly not this past winter. Um, so in an average winter, according to my 25 years of recording, we should be at about 76 inches of snowfall right now. And according to my records, we have 20 inches at our house. So we're about 56 inches short. And in most of my journals, we should get another three, four, six, eight inches before it's all over. Um, so there's a potential that we're going to be 60, 70 inches of snowfall in deficit of the average. Never mind, last winter was higher than normal um, and colder than normal. So last winter, it's hard to see. That's a bad shot of my digital thermometer in the dark. Um, that's negative 11.6. Last winter alone, we had 23 days below zero. So this year, is the warmest January and February in the world in history. So completely different year this year to last year. Um, so when I say survive winter, think last winter. Don't think what this long spring that we're having or this long autumn, however you look at it. So for an example, this is our witch hazel. And it started blooming the last week of January this year which it shouldn't start until March. You know, March is probably just about right. So it might be budding out right now, but this is the last week of January, full bloom. So it gives you an idea of a little, uh, a little idea of how warm it is. We grew greens right through the winter. We don't have a greenhouse. We have a cold frame, um, but we still have greens that we're eating. I just planted more lettuce, um, but a great winter if you wanted to grow food in your garden. Not a great winter for a lot of other things. So in a normal winter, what are some of the challenges that animals face? Food. food? So what about food? Scarce. Scarce food, OK. What was that? Covered. It's covered. The food's covered, exactly. So it's hard to access the food. Yes, mobility, so it's a challenge for, with deep snow. And they can't dig as well because it's frozen. Can't dig, is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah, exactly, the ground's frozen. We've got two more. Cold, that are, water. cold, is that? Cold and lack of water. Lack. Those are the two. So, so very cold temperatures, can't really dig in the ground. You know, potential for dehydration, starvation, freezing to death. You know, it's pretty tough out there. So how about trees and plants? What are some of the challenges that they face? 
freezing and thawing. The weight of the snow. The weight of the snow, excellent. What was that? Wind burn. Wind burn, right, right. So like dehydration from wind and drying. Yep. Anybody else? Snow breaking Perfect. Lots of snow. How about the sunlight? Less sunlight. A lot less sunlight, right? So um, they can't photosynthesize as well. They can't grow as fast. They can't create energy. And water. You know, the, if the ground's frozen, it's really hard to absorb the water. So unlike the trees and the plants, animals have options, right? The trees are somewhat relatively stuck here. Um, but what options do the animals have? Migration. Migration, exactly. So definitely birds love to migrate. Geese do it. I'm not sure if these are bohemian or cedar waxwings, but I know. Cedar. Yeah, you know they're cedar. I had cedar, but I wasn't sure. So bohemian waxwings actually come south to here, and cedar waxwings actually go south from here. So, um, but yeah, so they can, they can migrate. So it gets cold, they go south. Um, so anybody recognize these? Close, but not. <laughs> They're uh, snow buntings. So this is actually their winter plumage, which becomes brown, which is odd. They're white in the summer and brown in the winter. And the reason is, is because in the summer, they're up at the Arctic Circle. So this is actually the top of Mount Equinox, and this pair was there, and we also saw a pair at um, Merck Forest. But they're always looking for bare ground, so where the wind's blown the snow off of a patch, they'll be there looking for grass seeds and things. Um, so these birds actually, this is like their southern limit. This is south to them. So, so you know, it's interesting how we see geese fly to fl Florida, um, but these guys actually fly to Vermont to warm up. And then other birds just kind of stick around. It's a little dark, but that's morning doves on our front porch. Um, but you know, some birds just stick around all year, especially with feeders and things. They have options. So one of the things that I see a lot when I'm hiking is we see little flocks of birds. And you know, at first you hear it, it's like, oh, it sounds like chickadees. And you look, and it's actually chickadees and some nuthatches and some downy woodpeckers and sometimes some juncos or tough titan mice will be mixed in. So it's interesting how all these different species will actually group together and fly around and look for food. And why do you think that is? I'm asking a lot of questions. Safety in numbers. Safety in numbers, exactly. Yep, they can be looking for non-competitive food too, right? So, so one might be eating seeds and the other one's eating worms and the other one's eating flies or something like that. So they actually can work together to flush each other's prey out. So um, chickadees uh, specifically are known to sometimes spend really cold nights in uh, old woodpecker holes. So um, sometimes inside those, they'll, they'll spend the night just to stay warm. They'll huddle together, a group of them, um, just to stay warm. Nancy and I always wonder, you know, why don't, why don't the little birds just kind of cuddle up to the owls and stuff at night, you know, just crawl inside there and stay warm. So what's a way that mammals can deal with deep snow? Snowshoes, yeah, so snowshoe hair, right? Lynx. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, think like mammals that you know of that can deal with really deep snow. Well, I'm thinking of the buffalo bison. That's a silent type. Okay. How about a Vermont animal? Okay, so that's one way, but how do you get through deep snow? Yep, voles go under the snow. How about over the snow? Know of any animal that walks through deep snow? Moose, right? What's, you know, moose have legs up to here, right? So, so that's, it's interesting. Moose um, actually have long legs and they also have like a special, it's almost like a rotator cuff, but they can move their hips in a certain way so that they can pull their feet out and get, you know, higher steps. So, um, 
moose. This is, I do have a picture of a moose, but I, there are a few pictures that I borrowed tonight from other people because they had much better pictures than I do. Uh, so this is Anne McLaren from up in uh, Langrove. She let me borrow this photograph of a young moose. Um, so they also grow really thick fur coats, right, to stay warm. And moose is known for that. They have like an undercoat and then a really an overcoat. Um, so they stay warm. Um, does anybody recognize what this is? Yeah. Very similar to a moose, just a little smaller. Deer, yeah. So this is deer. This is deer uh, browsing. So they're, they're scratching, looking for acorns, um, some of these green plantain um, sedges and stuff. So they're, they're digging around looking for things to eat. So when the snow isn't too deep, you'll see a lot of little areas like this, and that's, that's the deer looking for food. So some animals avoid, you know, walking on the snow altogether. These, uh, I can't imagine being a beaver because they stay in their den, which is dark. You know, there's no lights in their den. So they're just staying in this dark, cave, basically. And then when it's dark out, they go underwater. So they pile up twigs all fall. They'll cache their twigs under the water. And they'll go out and get them. And then they'll come back in and they'll eat them in their, you know, in their lodge. So it's just interesting to me that a beaver might not see the sun for you know, six months. You know, if, the, if there's snow on the ice, and they can't see the sun while they're in the water, and they can't see it while they're inside. You know, so it's a, a long, dark winter for a beaver. So beavers stay active all winter, deer, moose, you know, so these are animals that are active, you know, right from beginning to end of winter. Cottontail rabbit, active all winter long. And sometimes you can see signs of them uh, chewing the, usually the tips of the branches. You can see a few cut branches there, and they'll chew on the bark. There's a couple of little bark marks there. Um, we've actually had some eating our fruit trees, um, so we put that wire mesh on the outside of the trunks um, so they don't eat the fruit trees. Um, but they stay active all winter. Chipmunks, right? So what's, a, what's the way that a chipmunk gets through the winter? Not quite. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? Because you can, what was that? Yeah, they burrow in the ground. And what do they put in the ground? Nuts. Yeah, nuts. So chipmunks are one of the few animals that have pouches, like a hamster. And they'll just fill their pouches. So they'll find food, and they'll fill their pouches. And they'll cache it sometimes in their holes near where they are. Sometimes they'll put it in random holes outside of their nest. Um, so they'll stuff their cheeks and they, believe it or not, they stay relatively active. What they do is they actually, they'll, they'll sleep for a long period. So they'll sleep for a few weeks and then they'll get up and they'll eat some food and defecate and then they'll go back to sleep and, you know, they kind of do that all winter but mostly stay underground. Um, so they, they pretty much have all the, the food and resources they need for the winter. So here's a, an acorn that a chipmunk was eating when I walked up to it. Uh, you can see the little teeth marks on that piece down there. So here's uh, in the springtime when the snow's you know, melting and getting shallower, the chipmunk will go out and he'll try to find these caches that he had you know, for what wouldn't fit in the nest. Let's put in you know, these reserves outside of, of his tunnels. So um, it's hard to see, but can anybody pick out what was in here besides leaves and ferns that he dug up to find his cache? You can see there's beech nuts, exactly. Yep, yep. So let me see if I can do this. Laser pointer. So beech nut there. There's a bunch of beech nuts in here. Um, there's one there, one there. So those are the beech nuts. So this is what a beech nut looks like before a chipmunk gets to it. Um, and has anybody eaten a beech nut? Delicious or what? Aren't they? Um, so there's usually 
uh, one husk like this. It's almost like a chestnut that splits open and then there's two uh, nuts inside. And the nuts come out and they're kind of triangular shaped. And they're very sweet. So that's the nut inside the shell. And, or that's out of the shell, I should say. Um, but almost like corn. So I'd like a nutty corn flavor is probably the best way I can describe it. So a very, very sweet nut, very delicious. But there's somebody else who likes beech nuts better than I do. Another Ann McLaren photo. Um, so bears love beech nuts. That's like their favorite food. Um, so bears, chipmunks, raccoons, and skunks also, they'll sleep for long periods of time, but not true hibernation. Hibernation is like from first sign of winter till winter's over, they're out and their body temperature, there's all these different definitions of hibernation, but their body temperature will be close to the temperature in the space that they're in if they're actually uh, hibernating. So bears sleep for a long time. Um, they'll eat five times their normal uh, food intake for this period in the fall right before they're going into hibernation. So they're just chowing down and they'll grow about five inches of fat on the outside of their bodies um, before they're ready to sleep for a while. So you can see those are all beech nuts way up in the top of the tree um, and they're kind of thin branches. So in a beech trunk can start off really thick, but once it gets up there, it's all these small branches with all the nuts on it. And bears love to gorge themselves on it. So if you're ever out in the woods and you see a beech tree that's at least 16 inches, maybe a little bit bigger, but probably about 16 inches, look for marks on it like this. And if you see that, there's a chance that you'll actually see there's scratch here, scratch there, scratches there, scratches there. You can see him go all the way up. So he climbed all the way up this tree, you know, shuffling as he went. So it's front feet and back feet, front feet and back feet, climbing all the way up there. I see about one of these trees every two to three years, I find a new one of these trees. And this morning, I found a new one. So uh, maybe it's a sign for tonight's presentation, but um, I was mountain biking in Dorset this morning and I found one. So this is the bat cave, uh, one of the bat caves in Dorset, barred off uh, to keep people out. Um, but bats are one of the few species that actually truly hibernate. So they slow down their metabolism, they reduce their body temperature, and they sleep all winter long. Um, woodchucks also do, and there's a couple of species of mice that do. All right. So moving on to reptiles. Does anybody know, first of all, how does a turtle breathe? Does it breathe underwater or out of water? Nope. <laughs> how do they breathe? Where do they get their oxygen from? from the air, right? Not underwater. They don't have gills. They can't breathe underwater. Yet, they spend five to six months hibernating underwater. So it's like, how do you hold your breath for five or six months? It's amazing. So one of the stories in Bird Heinrich's book, he's saying that uh, they actually sent divers near Lake Champlain in one of the rivers and they found um, one species of turtle, there'd be a pile of them, you know, maybe a hundred or so turtles all piled up in this one area and they all have their um, arms and legs and head, you know, necks extended and their tails out and they think they can actually absorb some oxygen through their skin and they think that's how they're able to get through the winter. But snapping turtles and some other turtles, I think eastern painted turtles, will actually burrow into the mud. So talk about oxygen depletion, you know, how, how for five or six months do you stay in mud and you have to breathe air? You know, it's, so these are the things that we still don't know the answers to, so it's, it's pretty amazing. Yes? Yeah, 
Yeah, but I mean, just keep your heartbeat going for five or six months without breathing. I don't know. It's, it's pretty, again, pretty amazing store. What was that picture taken? This picture? Hilton Head. Was it Hilton Head? <laughs> it's the only parallel picture I had, but I did take it. This one's a lot closer to home. So how about frogs? What do they, how do they take in oxygen? They breathe air too, right? And where do frogs spend the winter? Anybody know? Mostly, most of the frogs, there's exceptions to everything. Most of the frogs actually just go into the woods and they'll crawl under some leaves and they'll stay there. And they'll spend the, the winter on land. You know this guy, this is a little tree frog in our yard. Um, so wood frogs, spring peepers, some salamanders, they'll just crawl under leaf litter. The temperature will drop 22 below. And they'll freeze solid. And they somehow they convert, uh, what is it? Glucose, I think they can, they can either increase the amount of glucose or they can convert glucose into glycol, which is like an antifreeze. So there, some of them actually allow certain, like the exterior of the cell to freeze and others um, actually have this antifreeze. So it's just, again, all amazing stuff so that they make their own antifreeze and they freeze solid. Um, and the antifreeze kind of goes throughout their blood. So as soon as an ice crystal forms on an amphibian or a frog or salamander, um, within a day, they start this antifreeze process. Um, and then that gets them through the winter. Their metabolism drops way down. So unfortunately, this is the only picture of a toad I have. And it's also a picture of a garter snake. Um, <laughs> um, but. Uh, do, does any, has anybody f seen a toad during winter or any time of year? <laughs> That's not, okay. See them, See them all the time hopping on top of the ground. Yeah. But do you know where they go for the winter, what they do for the winter? Burrow. They burrow, right. So most toads will actually burrow down into the soil. And as the ground freezes, they'll just keep working their way down. So if the ground freezes four feet down, the toads will go four feet down. If the ground only freezes 18 inches down, that's this. So they actually try to stay ahead of the, the freezing ground. And they're in this kind of semi-torpor, um, very delirious, slow, sleepy mode. So they, you know, it must be a challenge for them, but that's, that's how they do it. And how about the snakes? Does anybody know what snakes do to get through the winter? Yeah, so um, exactly, exactly. So um, sometimes snakes will travel for miles and they have this, you know, one or two crevices in a cliff face or something like that. And they'll all just kind of cram in there and they'll ball up and they, uh, they just try to survive out the winter. But that's, that's how they do it. Some years they'll have 30 to 50% mortality rate um, just because the ones on the outside freeze first. Um, but that's, that's how they survive, and uh, it's just kind of amazing to me. But um, So what does this have to do with anything I'm talking about? <laughs> I don't have potatoes in my ears. Um, but when we were digging up our last batch of potatoes in early December, we, I actually dug up a toad. And he was down about 24 inches already. Um, so he was getting ready, ready to spend the, the winter. And you could tell, I mean, he, he almost seemed like he was frozen. He just didn't move, you know, he was just all huddled up. Um, but I, so I didn't run in the house and get my camera, which I should have taken a picture and put him back. I put him back immediately. And he's very lucky that it, the pitchfork didn't get very close to him. Um, so, because that potato right there wasn't so lucky. Um, so, Pretty amazing. I don't have a picture of the toad, but I have the picture of the potatoes. 
How about insects? We're gonna shift gears here. We talked about mammals and we talked about reptiles. Now we're gonna talk about insects. How do insects survive the winter? Ever think about that? Yes. Exactly. In the ground. Some of them are in the ground, yes. So, does anybody know of one insect that migrates like the birds? Monarch, Monarch. Monarch butterfly, exactly. So, it might be the only insect, and there might be a million others that we don't know about. Some dragonflies. Some dragonflies do too, yeah. So, pretty wild that very few species actually migrate, but they have that option. Here's our monarch. Monarchs have been decreasing in numbers a lot in the recent years. Don't know if it has to do with forestry down in Mexico, but it may. Um, so this is actually where a lot of insects, believe it or not, spend their winter. Um, so things like centipedes, millipedes, um, bees, uh, ground beetles, they all uh, will burrow into the soft wood and get inside. And believe it or not, it's really dry in there. It's kind of like dry rot inside. Um, Semi-insulated from the weather, but they still freeze. You know, um, They still get very cold. Um, so if you have stumps like this, moss-covered stumps that are decomposing, um, believe it or not, it's, it's the winter refuge for most, um, especially bees, a lot of wasps, uh, beneficial wasps and things will go in there. Uh, bumblebees even to survive through the winter. So there's our resident millipede. Um, so the, usually it's only the queen of the bee species that will uh, survive the winter. Um, so this is a bumblebee on a dewy morning um, on an echinacea. Um, but the, the queen bumblebee will uh, be one of the things that you can find in those old stumps. And if anybody knows what the heck this thing is, let me know, because I took a picture of it. I can't identify it. I don't know what it is. It looks like an ant that had too much for dinner. Um, but so, um, so Bern Heinrich, again, um, he and his father used to go looking for these beneficial wasps. And that's where they used to look, was in the stumps. And sometimes they'd find none, and sometimes they hit the jackpot, and they would find all these other insects uh, in the same place, so it's the mossy stump. So these, these are, um, I think it's like the hawk moth, moth um, larvae that makes this cocoon. So it's really big moths, um, bag, bag worms, I think some people call them or something like that. Um, so s some insects just freeze solid and that's how they get through the winter. You know, there's not much insulation in, you know, a sixteenth of an inch of paper. Um, but it's interesting that different species will free, be able to freeze at different stages of their life. So some can freeze solid as an egg, some can freeze solid as a pupa, some can freeze solid as an adult. Um, so that, that was the interesting thing about uh, insects to me. Woolly bear caterpillars, you know, we'll see them late in the fall crossing the road and all over the place, and then they just like crawl under a leaf and then free solid. And then if it gets sunny and warm, you know, they might walk for a couple of days until it gets cold again and they'll free solid again. So they can freeze and thaw multiple times throughout the you know, fall and winter and keep going. This is one of the exceptions, the honeybee, right? What does the honeybee do in the winter? Stay in the hive. Stay in the hive, right. So the only reason they can do that is because they have food, right? So they have honey, and um, again, another little tidbit, the hive from when it's, you know, like 90 degrees outside to when it's negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the temperature inside the hive will only fluctuate a couple of degrees. And the, the bees are just amazing at uh, regulating the temperature. So in the winter time, they'll make like this ball and they'll all shiver and that shivering burns calories and gives off heat. 
And then as it gets to a certain temperature, the, the bees in the center will crawl out and that actually makes cooling channels. Um, so they, they can actually regulate their temperature by shivering and moving and opening up space and making the ball bigger and smaller. Um, so anybody ever see these in the snow? Snow fleas is what we typically call them, right? Merc Forest, Merc Forest you saw them last week? Yeah, yeah. So it's just amazing these things thrive all winter. You know, it's like they have a party when it's winter time. Most other animals and insects and things are, you know, crawling, hiding, freezing. Not these guys. And they're tiny. So that's a, a jelly bean for size comparison to give you an idea of how small these are. It looks like someone spreads pepper on the snow, but the pepper. Yeah, exactly. It looks like dirt or salt pepper. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, that's a picture I did not take, this little detail, but I took all the others. Um, so they're actually called springtails, and they have this little hook, you know, almost like this barb at the end, and they tuck that in, and they actually, it's almost like Tigger, you know, he's got like a springtail. Um, so that's actually how they hop. So they don't hop like fleas do. They, it's more like a cricket, I guess, if you will, or Tigger. So that's springtails. But mosquitoes, you know, this is January, two feet of snow on the ground last winter. Um, different species of mosquitoes. I do know that there are some mosquitoes who can freeze solid and then come into the house with the firewood and they can warm up and bite me in the neck. So, you know, it's obvious that some adult mosquitoes can survive very cold temperatures um, because it's, I see them. Uh, spiders, again, it's, it's, it's just amazing that all these insects can just go about their business in the middle of winter on, you know, two feet of snow, like nothing's, nothing's changed. Um, this is a winter moth. And these, uh, they get active in about November, right through March. They survive as adults through the entire winter. They can freeze solid as an adult moth. And you can see the, the wings are always moving. That's how they keep warm. They're shivering, basically. So even when they're sitting on a, a leaf like this, his wings are shaking, and that's how they keep their body temperature up. What they eat, well, they probably eat nectar at this point, but very similar to, uh, cat, you know, caterpillars. Their caterpillars probably eat some kind of leaf. Um, they, I don't know if they go after colt's foot in the spring. I don't know if they, you know, because they're so cold, if they're able to keep their metabolism low. I don't know what they eat on a typical winter, if they eat at all as moths. I don't, but good question. So we talked about mammals, and we talked about birds, and we talked about reptiles. What else did we talk about? Insects. Now we're going to talk about trees. OK? So what is it that a deciduous tree does every year? Right. So it puts all this time and energy you know, from March until July making these big giant solar panels, right? That's what they're doing. Putting out these solar panels, they keep them out there for a couple of months and then they, they dump them. You know, so it's very energy intensive to make leaves. You know, they do it every year, year after year after year. You know? So just think of how much energy that they have to spend on just making leaves for a few months and getting rid of them. You know, they certainly aren't out there for six months. So from a distance, you know, here's a deciduous tree. It looks dead. It looks like there's, you know, nothing going on. But when you get closer, you know, you can see. So trees actually make their leaf and flower buds the summer before, you know. So this is the middle of winter. This was made while the, you know, it was photosynthesizing. It had all these huge green leaves out there. And it's already starting next year's leaf buds. So it's taking all the energy that it's making in the summer, it's preparing the leaves and flowers for next year, and then those survive through the winter. So even if, you know, it doesn't have the perfect conditions, it'll already have all the bits and pieces it needs to, to create leaves come spring. 
And I mean, some of the buds are just huge, swollen. Yes? Well, that's been, I mean, as you probably know, the, the danger of buds coming out too soon and the blossoms coming out too soon, because if you do have a frost, it kills them. Right, right. So they are delicate. Yeah, yeah, so definitely a challenge. So evergreen conifers, what do they do with their leaves? They keep them on, right? So they make them a little bit smaller and they hold on to them. So there's a lot of advantages to that. You know, it doesn't take them all this energy, you know, all summer to create these things that they're just going to throw away. Um, notice the, the way the branches bend, you know, much more flexible branches. So they're actually creating a cone um, when the snow gets heavy. So they're, they've, over millions of years, they've evolved to be like the perfect shape. Um, they can photosynthesize right through the winter because they still have their leaves on. Um, so pretty wild. So there's close up of some needles photosynthesizing. And even when they're little tiny saplings, you know, the snow doesn't weigh them down. You know, just think if that was an oak, a young oak sapling with those two giant leaves, you know, with a little bit of snow on it and be crushed. All right, besides trees, there's plants, right? Um, so annual plants, how do annual plants get from one year to the next? Seeds, Seeds right? So here's some burdock that's, this is the, the real plant that invented Velcro before man did. Um, that's actually, you can see the little hooks on there, it's identical to a piece of Velcro. So some, the annuals keep their, create seeds and use those to start next year. How about perennials? What do they do? Some can have seeds, yeah. Bulbs, right? Bulbs, roots, rhizomes, tubers. So they store a lot of their energy. They'll take in the sunlight. They'll store it underground. They'll get through the winter and then they'll come up again in the spring. But then there are some perennials that are evergreen, you know, like the club mosses. Um, these are actually related to the pine trees, the, actually the cedar trees, I guess. Um, but they've they evolved. They used to be big, giant conifers. Some ferns, uh, Christmas ferns, very leathery evergreen. Sometimes the wood ferns are semi-evergreen or evergreen. Um, but they stay green right through the winter. They can still photosynthesize if he gets lucky enough and lands on a tree trunk like this guy did. But then there's also all these mosses and lichens and things that are green. You know, that's when we go hiking in the woods, I just love seeing mosses and lichens and ferns that are green because, you know, everything else just looks so desolate and it's great to see green life. All right, time for a little experiment. Um, if you don't mind, if you want to get up and stretch your legs, we're going to move over to the table here. And I'm just going to do a quick little demonstration, and I've got a few things to show you. Who's here at the last presentation <laughs> and remembers the experiment? <laughs> so I've uh, recycled the house from the last uh, presentation, and I've made uh, an evergreen conifer here and a deciduous tree here and just trying to demonstrate why trees tend to lose, you know, deciduous trees want to drop their leaves in the winter and, you know, how evergreen trees are designed to handle it better. So this is, this is probably hail, but we'll pretend it's snow, right? And it kind of just, right? So perfect shape, you know, it just rolls right off. Of course, if they were stickier, they probably wouldn't roll right off. This is, a, this is the first attempt at this. I, I only built one, so let's see what happens. But just think, you know, if this is a, a deciduous tree and it has, you can, see, you can see some of the branches are bending and breaking and stuff like that, you know. I wanted to do this with wet sand, but I think it would make a total mess. Um, but you can get the idea, you know, that, see, it's, it's holding on to the snow, it's bending the branches. This one actually broke. Um, but that's just kind of a, an idea or a, 
a visualization of the difference between the trees and why. Um, and then here, these are some uh, trees, tree stems that are branches that we cut uh, two weeks ago, maybe three, two and a half weeks ago. Um, so we've got, this is pear, peach, uh, black birch, this is silver maple, I think, hobblebush viburnum. Um, but you can see, you know, these have been sitting in water. They're not getting any energy from anywhere. No sugar, no nothing. And they're still making these leaves that they really created last year. And, you know, they're just growing. Now that it, they've been warm long enough, um, they're able to flower. You know, you can see some of the flowers here, uh, the maples flowering, or put out their leaves. And you can see this is a, a hobble bush here, flowers and bracts, but the leaves still haven't even began to bud. So there's certain mechanisms that trigger them to flower at a certain time and others that say, okay, now it's safe to put out the leaves. Because right now, you know, there might be some winter moths and some early flies and things out there that could pollinate this, but they don't want to sacrifice this year's leaves just yet. We still have an opportunity right up until May to have another snowstorm. So these buds, you know, look just like they did in December. That's a smart plant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they grow at higher elevations, so they, they tend, to, uh, tend to see more snow. And then here, um, I'll pass some around this way and some around this way. So this is, uh, these are some of the things, it's called mast. So it's uh, typically nuts. So there's pine nuts, pine cone seeds, um, beech nut in there, acorns. Oh, I think that's everything. Oh, and uh, some, good, right? <laughs> maybe I should pass it without the bottom. I'll take the lid. One less thing to hold on to. Um, and there's hickory nuts. So if you're ever walking in the woods, you'll see some winters that there's just tons of acorns everywhere that makes it hard to climb hills and it's like ball bearings. And other years there's no acorns. And the same thing with beech nuts. You know, two years ago we had an amazing beech nut uh, harvest. This year, no beech nuts, you know. And, and the animals, you know, sometimes they get lucky and there's acorns and beech nuts. And sometimes there's nothing, you know, so it's, um, it's year to year. And, and these are the things that, you know, the bears and the deer and the chipmunks all rely on. And, and it's referred to as mast. So if it's a good mast year, there's a lot of seeds, um, some berries uh, for them to eat. But uh, that's a good example of what they eat. So that's it. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, um, with what you just said, um, have you talked to any park rangers or forest rangers? Like, if there's a year that they don't have anything, do they see more animal die off? I would assume they do, but I haven't asked them specifically mm -hmm. that. Um, fortunately, we, you know, there's different ty types of uh, conifers. Mm -hmm. So you'll get maybe, you know, there's five or six different conifers. So you might get a good pine cone off of one tree and not so good off the other. So usually there's a good balance. You know, the same thing happens with apples. You know, some years we have amazing apple crops like we did last year. Um, some years we have none. Um, so I think usually it all works out. But um, so they, uh, again, uh, in Burns' book, he talks about the chipmunks. If it's an amazing mast year and there's tons of these nuts and berries and seeds are available, chipmunks might just stay awake and run around all winter long because they have so much food stored up and they don't know there's so much food to go around that they can just burn all the energy they want. And other winters, like this winter, our chipmunk stayed, you know, probably four months in his burrow and never came out once, you know. So I th it's amazing how they'll adjust to how much food there is and, and you know, how full the pantry is uh, to how much energy they'll burn. Aren't those your trees, Alan? No, I did not make those, um, but that's what the that's deciduous trees want to look like. No, but good timing, isn't it? <laughs> Very appropriate decoration. Um, you'll probably see this again at the next presentation. You never know. <laughs> it's kind of nice to be able to. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. One thing I thought that 
maybe you were trying to bring in some deciduous trees on the side and see how long they keep the leaves on without being outside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Is everybody ready to take a quiz? We're not done with the presentation. Come on. <laughs> You're really going home? <laughs> done with the demonstration. It's time for Name That Track. All right. We'll see who can get 100 on this exam. OK. How about this one? Cross country skis. All right. Can't fake you guys out. Just deer. Deer, yep. OK. We'll start easy. Rabbit, very good. There he is, just to prove it. She. Yes, sweet pea, you're right. <laughs> now, these are a little smaller. I, I, I should, usually when I take a picture, I don't have a tape measure with me, but. Um, so I think smaller than a raccoon. Squirrel. squirrel, yep. This might be a red squirrel or a gray squirrel. It's hard to know. Um, we do have gray squirrels. Does anybody else have black squirrels now? Yep, yep. So they're making a good comeback. Um, so apparently the story with those is that there used to be a lot of black squirrels everywhere. They're the same species, the grays and the blacks, and it's just a, it's kind of like black labs, chocolate labs, and yellow labs. Um, but when there was more tree cover, so when we were completely forested, the black squirrels could hide better because it was a lot darker and the bark and everything. When we clear cut and things were uh, these gray little wispy uh, sprouts coming up, then the gray squirrels were actually able to hide better from the predators and the black squirrel population tanked. Um, so now that we're getting much more mature firsts, uh, the, the black squirrels are making a comeback. So we have one or two black squirrels in our yard every year now. All right, um, there's tracks there, they're hard to see, um, but here's a good example of a red squirrel. They, uh, they love spruce cones and they eat all the seeds in them. They'll eat it like corn on the cob if you ever see them. But they'll usually sit up on a stump or a log somewhere high and they'll just take a, a whole cone and chow it down. Anybody know what does that? Nice yep, so a red squirrel typically will also store apples. We had four or five apples tucked in our trees um, all winter. I think that's in the hawthorn actually. All right, how about this one? Some kind of bird. Turkey. turkey, yep, yep. So this is a very slow walking turkey because usually they take bigger steps than this, but this was probably a, it was crossing a trail, so I think it was you know very cautiously walking out. Um, Kathy Stewart, thank you for, this is, Kathy Stewart has a uh, game camera, so she supplied me with some photos. She's sitting in the back. All right, this one's not so easy, but um, it's under a spruce tree in the snow, if that helps. Here's a close-up of the actual footprints. Grouse, exactly. And it might be hard to see. Oh, you could see them. This is actually the wing feathers. When they're taken off, they always make all that ruckus. It's because they're flapping really hard. So that's their wing imprint uh, of them taking off, rough grouse. How about this one? I'll give you a better shot. Now, notice this line. Dale, yeah. No, it's actually hopping. Mouse, yep, yep. So here's one in our peach tree. <laughs> Getting some early morning sun for whatever reason. Um, so voles, yeah. So. So there's this layer, you might know about it, but then when the ground freezes, it's really hard to dig in the ground, so voles start working on top of the ground. And if we have snow cover, if it's deep enough, you'll never see a vole all winter long. But when we only have an inch or two, they kind of make their tunnels you know, between the frozen ground and the surface of the soil, and sometimes they show up really well like this. This winter, uh, this is actually from Renee Travis, uh, Travers. She, uh, she took this picture. She takes amazing bird photographs um, up in northern Vermont. Um, but when there's no snow cover and no subnivian layer, you know, the animals that are usually using that as their secret highway uh, are really easy to pick off. 
So sometimes it's really difficult to see the footprints. You know, if the snow is deep um, or really dry, we had a lot of dry snow last winter because it was so cold, so it was really powdery and it didn't make good footprints. Um, but you can see this track and it goes all the way back. You know, it goes down his hill and up that hill. Um, can you kind of guess how big this animal is? It's, it's relatively small. You can see how its, its legs never come out of the snow, right? right? So this is, let's say this is maybe eight inches of snow. So it's, uh, it's a low animal. My mouse got stuck. Oh, here we go. So that same animal did this. Yeah. Porcupines are crazy. They will climb. We saw one hanging over, or it was actually a quarry down below, and it was on this two inch diameter branch, probably 50 feet you know, down to the bottom of the quarry, and it's hanging out there just chewing on the bark. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll do this. This is a little close up of their teeth. You'll see these marks on, uh, they, sometimes they kill the tree, sometimes they girdle it all the way around, sometimes they're smart and they just do bits and pieces. So uh, this winter, believe it or not, there was some snow on the ground. Uh, we actually saw a porcupine Mount Independence. We were at the park in Mount Independence. Um, this seemed like a pretty young porcupine. He was very talkative. I guess they always are, but, uh, but very small. He was maybe basketball size, so pretty small for a porcupine. And at first when I saw these tracks, I was like, oh, somebody's backcountry skiing. We were actually hiking up Bromley. And, um, and then I saw them go on both sides of a tree. And I was like, oh, that's not a skier, right? So any guesses on this guy? Otter. Otter, it is. So if you follow the tracks long enough, when the downhill stopped, he actually got up and he had to walk over here. So I was able to actually find some footprints. But yeah, they have a blast. There's no doubt that they're having fun. When otters are sledding down a hill like that, um, you can almost see them smiling. Okay. So um, this is something that Sue, t Sue Morse talks about, but um, it's hard to see. It's not the best footprint I have, but um, you can kind of see that there's really sharp lines, like straight lines for the toes, and there's like this X that goes through the footprint here. Um, but that identifies it as a dog canine species. Um, so it's actually a fox footprint. Another Kathy Stewart photo, thank you. Uh, but these. I have a comment about fox. Yes. We live on the east side, or live, we're living on East Arlington Road. Yep. And there was a, a mother fox that had seven. Wow. Seven kids. Yep. And that was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We have one that visits our yard every morning right before sunrise, <laughs> kind of walks through, um, checks out the bird feeder and stuff. Um, but they always, like, they walk, they're, to me, they're more like a cat. You know, they walk in single file, you know, they can climb trees, very small feet. Um, That's one of them that banks on the railroad tracks. Right? Excellent. Damn. And my neighbor had one uh, living in their compost pile. They had a, just a pile in the fox den in there and had kids. Can you guys see these footprints? This is the best shot I have of them. Um, yeah, I'm afraid to put this back on, but we'll see. But you can see that it's asymmetrical and there's not like uh, really sharp edges and there's no X. It's almost like an M shape in here instead of an X. But these are cat tracks. These are actually bobcat. So how big was the track? Two, I'd say two inches across. It was a pretty big bobcat because they're supposed to be about golf ball size and it was definitely bigger than a golf ball. And that was on Mount Equinox, um, almost at the summit. So I wear a size extra large glove. Um, so scaling this, this footprint from 
toe to heel where my fingertip is, it's about nine inches. And it's about four inches across. And I don't know if these footprints both happened at the same time. They might not have. They might have been two different days or two different weeks, who knows. Um, or it could have just been standing uh, still for a moment. Any idea what might have a footprint that's nine inches long and four inches wide? Bear, bear yep. So this was a black bear. This is on uh, Pico, backside of Mount uh, near Killington. Mount Pico, I guess. Pico Mount? Is it Pico Mountain or Mount Pico? We just call it Pico, don't we? Pico Peak. Yes, we we saw them probably for 30 or 40 feet. They followed. The, they actually came onto the trail and followed the trail for a little while, and then wandered off into kind of this ledgy area. Um, but there was a bunch of footprints. This was the best. It's it's interesting how difficult it is to take photographs of footprints in the snow. And if it was in the mud, it would be so much easier. But in the snow, it's really hard to get shadows and lighting and contrast. Um, so. so I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. And the next time you see footprints like this, or you see a hole like this with a big mess around it, or you see some claw marks like that, I hope it catches your eye and you spend a little more time, you know, trying to observe and trying to learn the rest of the story. Um, you know, that's, that's really the goal for tonight is to get you to not just see things, but to observe. Yes? Do you observe anything from owls in the wintertime? It's interesting. I occasionally see an owl in the wintertime, barred owls typically on Mount Equinox, but... Um, and I've heard other, uh, I think it's great horned owl that I've heard, but um, it's interesting. Owls, pretty elusive, at least for me. Um, I've seen more moose than I've seen owls. So next talk, which will be May 26th, uh, we're actually going to be talking about building a straw bale house now. So this is in the 21st century. I actually have clients who, here's the clients, cue the clients. Um, so clients that have built their retirement home in central northern Vermont um, using straw bale technique and timber frame. And they're actually going to be here and they're going to give half the presentation. And I'm going to do some kind of hands-on demonstration thing. I don't know if it'll be with straw bales or not, but it may be. I don't know if I can fit even one straw bale in that house, but we're going to try. So thank you. And thanks, Kathy, and thanks to Cindy and the library and GNAT TV for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah.